Good afternoon, and welcome to the Mission to Mars event. Thank you for taking the time to attend. Today, we will hear from three exceptional CMU alumni about their work on the Mars Perseverance rover. After the presentations, we invite you to stay and ask the panelists questions during our live Q&A. So, to kick things off, let me introduce you to our panelists today. First, we'll hear from Dr. Andrew Johnson. Andrew is the principal robotic system engineer for NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Since joining JPL in 1997, after graduating from the Robotics Institute program, Andrew has been developing technologies for autonomous navigation and mapping during descent to planets, moons, comets, and asteroids. For the Mars Exploration Rovers, he was lead developer for the Descent Image Motion Estimation System. And on Mars 2020, he led the development of the Lander Vision System that provided surface relative position estimates for terrain relative navigation. He was also the manager of the Mars 2020 guidance navigation and control subsystem, which included cruise, EDL, and surface mission functions. Next up, we have Emily Newman. Emily joined JPL in 2019, shortly after graduating from CMU. She was the lead developer for the telemetry processing backend of the Mars 2020 Entry Descent Landing Visualization, which was used to display perseverance landing live to millions of viewers. She has also worked on other projects within the Mission Control System section, including a cybersecurity network visualization and a system for storing mission data. She currently works on robotic operations for the Curiosity rover. Finally, Dr. Vandy Verma, will share a work on the Perseverance rover. Vendy is the deputy manager for mobility and robotic systems at JPL and the chief engineer of robotics operation for Mars 2020 Perseverance and Ingenuity rovers. She has worked on space robotics and AI research and technology development tasks and has designed, developed, and operated rovers on Mars. She leads about 170 JPL roboticists developing new technology for future missions and working on a variety of JPL robotic missions. She has been engaged in robotics operations on Mars since 2008 with the Mars Exploration Rover Spirit and Opportunity, Curiosity Rover, Perseverance Rover, and Ingenuity Helicopter. Moderating our Q&A this afternoon is Alan Boyle. Alan is a journalist specializing in space, science, and technology news. He worked for NBC.com and NBC News uh, Digital as science editor from 1996 to 2015. In 2015, he became aerospace and science editor for GeekWire and continues to write for GeekWire as a contributing editor. He's the author of The Case for Pluto and also past president of the Council for the Advancement of Science Writing, the official mastermind of Cosmic Log, and the host of the Fiction Science Podcast. We are so excited that our fantastic panel of speakers could join us today. And to get started, I turn the mic over to Andrew Johnson. Well, thank you very much, Marshall. So I'm gonna speak for a few minutes about the work that I did on Perseverance. Let me just share my screen here. Uh, so I left, uh, CMU in 1997 uh, out of the Robotics Institute. I, I believe I was one of Marshall's first students. I was in the Vision and Autonomous Systems Center and uh, that was an incredible experience. It taught me about computer vision, which I immediately started applying to uh, tasks and different projects at JPL. In fact, it turns out that uh, when I started, which was shortly after Mars Pathfinder landed, which had the first rover on the surface of Mars, uh, it turns out there wasn't really very much computer vision at all being used, especially for landing. And so that's been my objective the, my entire career is to increase the vision and the autonomy of these spacecraft when they're landing. So I'm gonna talk about terrain relative navigation, which is the latest system that we built for Mars 2020. <clears throat> when you land on Mars, there's a lot of mechanical things that happen to slow you down. You come through the atmosphere on a 
in a capsule, the heat shield slows you down. And then you know, the, the, uh, the system goes on to a parachute. Oh, I'm not sure why that happened. The system goes on to a parachute, slows you down more. And in that parachute phase is when terrain relative navigation operates. We take a sequence of images and we merge them with inertial measurement unit data. In the images, we match landmarks to a map that we've built from satellite imagery. So this is a vision-based inertial navigation system. This has never been done before on any lander, on any planet. This is the first time uh, for Mars 2020. Its purpose was to figure out where the lander was relative to a map so that it could so that the system on board could target a safe landing location uh, within the landing ellipse. The landing ellipse is about eight kilometers across. The place we wanted to go, called Jezero Crater, was just scattered with all kinds of really horrible hazards, like steep cliffs from an ancient river delta, craters, inescapable dune fields, and boulder fields. Uh, the system had enough uh, fuel on board to divert to a safe location. It did not have enough fuel, however, to go to a very specific point uh, on the system. So the system targeted this one of the, the safest location that was nearby. So that system for us was called the Lander Vision System. And it used vision as well as estimation techniques that many people are learning now in robotics and using other places. It had uh, two piece, a bunch of hardware. Uh, the special one was a, a special purpose camera that took uh, image quickly, uh, used global shutter. Wow, it has a mind of its own. Um, we also built our own computer called the Vision Compute Element that did high performance computing for space so that we could do this landmark matching very quickly. And then finally, there was an, a descent inertial measurement unit. And here you can see the different pieces of the spacecraft. So this movie is showing you the landmarks that are matched. And first, we, the system matched really large patches of a descent image, which is shown in the upper right, to the map, which is shown uh, at the lower right and also blown up on the left. Each one of these squares is a landmark match between the image and the map. Green and blue matches are correct uh, matches or inliers. The other colors are outliers. These are uh, matches that are, were determined to be incorrect based on the system that was developed. So uh, the landmark matching and inertial measurement unit data was collected from about 4,200 meters altitude above the ground down to 500 meters. And so you see through this sequence, it started up quite high and then it went down through the parachute phase. And then there's a Dura phase where the lander uh, moves over to target the safe site, and it all operated during that phase. So in conclusion, the, the system worked great. Um, you saw the landmark matches. There was many really excellent uh, landmark matches. Uh, we landed within five meters of our targeted location, and our requirement is to do that within 60 meters, so obviously very accurate. And uh, you can see here in these pictures the different hazards that place that are around in the landing else, large boulders and, and cliffs and things. Perseverance landed in a safe spot, but it was surrounded by hazards. And uh, so it really showed the how well the terrain relative navigation worked. So we're done with Perseverance, but now we've moved on to the next mission, which is Mars Sample Retrieval Lander. It's going to also need this terrain relative navigation capability and it will in fact do pinpoint landing, meaning landing at a very specific spot where the samples that Mars Perseverance has collected will be put down onto the surface. And it also could apply to other science missions. So thank you. And with that, I think I will hand it off to the next speaker. All right. I think that is me. Hello. Um, let me just share my screen. Okay, so um, this is kind of a lengthy name, but I repurposed a paper presentation for this. Um, I essentially worked on the visualization that showed the data from, well, partially from what Andrew just described, but also from just the positioning of the spacecraft during the landing event, which was around, which is what they tend to call the seven minutes of terror of entry, descent, and landing. So um, this project was, not just me. There is a, we had a group of about five 
maybe is, someone might be missing from here, but we have five software engineers plus my manager working on this project. Um, this is all of us on landing day, actually. And also, um, this is a slide about me that I like to throw in there. I'm a big fan of rock climbing, hiking, camping, airplanes, hair colors. <laughs> But yeah, so let me talk about the little visualization a little bit. This might be a little technical, but um, we built this web web based real time visualization for use by Mars 2020 engineers during EDL trajectory design testing and observation. So essentially, this tool started as an engineering tool for EDL engineers. We worked fairly closely with a couple of members of the EDL team, including Al Chen, who I believe is the lead, and. So we wrote it for them to use to like test their simulations. We were also working with Lang with Dave Way from Langley, who was um, part of the team working on testing various EDL scenarios. So we built this system intending to re use it in the future as a multi-mission software system. This one was heavily tailored towards Mars 2020 in particular. And so we were able to process many different sources of data and stream it in real time uh, this included simulation data from MATLAB files, as well as mission support testbed data, which we we basically ran it in tandem with um, test testbed for many different sessions and made the made the web page available to engineers who were able to watch it while the testbed sessions were running. And of course, we also used it during uh, more specific tests that were specific to like the actual EDL landing scenario, as well as we also used it on landing day to show the current status of the spacecraft. And so we, we essentially, we use data to display the status and health during EDL scenarios. Uh, this right here is a screenshot of the UI, which I will walk through in a bit. But first, you can see some of it in action. And this is a, I believe we had like 14 minutes of data. So this is a 14 minute long movie, but I'll just skip around to some interesting different parts. Um, so this is the EDL sequence. Most of the most of the data we got was in this state called wait for entry. So we're essentially just approaching Mars at this point. And most you can see like half of the data is just that. And I also want to add that this is um, the actual, this is data that we got on landing day. Um, and we uh, generated this video after the fact and um, it was reviewed for release. So yeah. A lot of the beginning is all just cruising in. We get to an interesting part around here. I think the, the parachute's actually deployed at this point. So you can see we are rendering, we're here are rendering some thruster data. I think we just kind of, we had some data that was generated used for that. Um, I think here is a. Uh, I think I believe these are radar lines that were used for TRN, which Andrew just described. We're kind of rendering them here, and of course we've got the parachute. You can see it's kind of moving around. TDS and yeah, that state was TDS nav init, which is the start of Andrew's algorithm going. So that's pretty fun. And then we can skip down here. This. This frustrum here, this uh, large pyramid here, is the field of view for one of the cameras that I think was also used for choosing the landing location. And at the end, we're going to skip all the way to the end landing. This green square here is the landing pixel rendered in our visualization. So this is the landing spot that was chosen by the algorithm. And you, know, you can see my giant mouse moving across the screen. But yeah. This is our vis in action. It was pretty fun. Let's see. Yep. Okay. So the client, this is, the, this is the client. We built it with Material UI and React, which are two pretty common web technologies. Um, we used, we had, uh, we had done a similar thing. Well, not me, but <laughs> people, my manager and others had worked on a similar landing visualization for. MSL, which is the Curiosity rover's landing, which happened in August of 2012. So we use that as inspiration, but we used kind of updated components, newer, sharply designed. Uh, we had redesigned everything. One of my coworkers is our UI developer. And we tried to leverage icons to convey some information without overwhelming text. We actually had to design this UI to serve engineers, which is why there's a bunch of data that people might not necessarily understand. But we also had to, we were also designing it with the intention that it would be streamed on NASA TV. So we had to design it in a way 
that the public could look at it and see something interesting, even if they didn't necessarily understand what was going on with all of this text at the side. So I think we kind of accomplished those, both those goals in a pretty decent way. We were inspired by certain other um, space companies that often televise their launches in cool, clean UI ways. So uh, this is the part I worked on in particular, and I'll go pretty fast through this because I don't want to take up too much time. But we positioned a lot of stuff on spice, spice based on spice data, and we had to do a lot of frame transformations in order to get the spacecraft where we wanted it to be. And that was the part I worked on in particular. This is me. Um, we also did a lot of testing. We had a lot of test bed runs, as I mentioned. We had operational readiness tests. We were in the loop for those. This picture is from an operational readiness test. Basically, we all came on lab and practiced like it was an actual landing day. And so we had lots of opportunities to validate our system. But at the same time, we had only one chance to make it work. So I'm glad it worked. <laughs> And then impact, I think we got some really awesome, really awesome pictures out of it. There's another picture that's not here, which is President Macron of France looking at our visualization. This is Biden looking at the visualization. It's on CNN. This is it in a, in a square in London with people looking at it. It was, it was broadcast in Times Square. So pretty cool. Everyone saw it. Hopefully you all saw it as you watched. Um, then we got overshadowed by the actual videos from landing. <laughs> but yeah, and we so I think it was really cool as a public outreach effort for JPL and the operational system on Lightning Day was just a MacBook Pro laptop. So my manager's laptop was just looking at this web client and streaming it to everybody. So, and of course we also used it was used by the ops team and was also used in reconstruction. So, and there was a paper published on it if you want to know more about the implementation. Yeah. That's all I have. Okay, I can pass it off to Vandy. Hi, thanks, Emily. I am going to share my screen now. So I'm going to be uh, talking. Uh, so I'm Vandy Berman. I'm going to be talking about autonomous robots and robotic operations, specifically in the context of, you know, perseverance and ingenuity, which I've worked on, and these are some of the areas that I personally work on. One of the main things, and interestingly, it does want to move as well. So one of the main things about the autonomous robotics capabilities we add on board the rover is it's really important to think about it in the perspective of what the goals of the mission are. Because if it doesn't actually make it so we can get that science that we're going for more efficiently, uh, we're not actually going to use that autonomous capability because the rovers on Mars are a very valuable resource and they are uh, on Perseverance, for example, there are 500 scientists from across the world who call in and uh, compete for accomplishing science. And so our goal on the robotic side is to make that happen as efficiently as possible. So the goal of Perseverance is to go study the geology and astrobiology of Mars, but also to prepare for astronauts. We've got an instrument that can synthesize oxygen uh, from the atmosphere. And the other aspect of it, the really the main part of this mission is to core, have a robotic drill that cores under the surface, collects sample cores intact, caches them for subsequent return to Earth. And that'll be the first time that we've ever returned samples from Mars to Earth. So as Andrew was uh, talking about the landing and as Emily was as well, so February 18th of 2021 is when we got to Mars and this shows landing day. My role, was pretty much to eat the peanuts and wait till we actually got to the surface uh, because I'm on the robotic side, uh, work on as soon as the rover touched down on the surface. So our destination was Jezero Crater. This crater, why it's interesting is because inside the crater, there's actually an ancient river delta and deltas are where we can have really high probability of finding signs of ancient life. Uh, so as soon as we land, we start to, you know, robotic operations come to the picture as soon as we hit the surface. We transition from uh, EDI entry, descent, and landing to surface operation. So what is the robotic operations, which is the area, uh, one of the areas that I work in? It involves all of the mobility and navigation. So that's driving and navigating the rover, uh, all the manipulation. So we have a 2.1 meter robotic arm that's over 100 kilograms with a 40 kilogram turret because at the end of that arm, we have a lot of payload instruments that can place in contact with the surface to get really good measurements 
in proximity and also position the drill. And then we have a sampling system, which inside the rover, we have a, sec we have a second robotic system. So there's a second robotic arm and a sample cache and assembly inside the rover where we hand off the tubes we collect to that ro robotic system and cache them. And then of course, the Mars helicopter Ingenuity, which demonstrated uh, the first control power fight in Mars. So that's the areas that we are sort of working in. The challenge we have is really, Mars is really far away. So the way we talk to our robots on Mars is we have a deep space network. There are three antennas in the world, in Madrid, Spain, and, um, and, we, and in uh, the US. And then we, it takes up to 24 minutes for a one-way line signal to get to Mars. We talk directly to the rover because the commands are pretty compact, but we take so much data that we transmit it through orbiters to Earth. Uh, if you were to operate this way, it's quite slow. And so we have a lot of capabilities where we send an entire day, a Martian stall of activities to the rover. So here I'm showing the landing location. So as Andrew was showing, as we were coming down for landing, actually landing was targeting this hazardous location. So terrain relative navigation diverted us, but diverted us away from the Delta. And so when we landed, we followed this path around to conduct some science in this area because we opportunistically said, we're here at Theta, let's do this. The white is showing the rover's path, the green, the helicopter flights. Once we were done with that, we wanted to get to the Delta. And this was the path that we took. And autonomous navigation resulted in just three weeks us covering five kilometers, which is kind of unheard of in planetary robotics term. So this rapid traverse we've just recently completed and the way we were able to do that is that we have the ability for the rover to autonomously navigate. So we tell it what goals we're going to and autonomously avoids hazards. And here you're seeing a movie of the images it's taking. It's using computer vision, uh, stereo processing with cameras. So the rover is actually, we, there's a lot of robotic operations involved where you have to tell it from the ground where the sand is because it can't detect it on board. Uh, and there's a lot of algorithms for how it models uncertainty on board. So these are very important aspects to go with your autonomous algorithm, because if you don't have that, it's not easy to operate and get to the destination you want it to. Um, the other aspect was we had the helicopter, so we'd send it ahead to scout out areas and see if we really wanted to send the rover there. And that was very valuable. Here you're seeing uh, an area where we sent the helicopter. And one of the other things I'm gonna talk about is just, we need capabilities on the rover. We're covering now 700 meters without ground, having any pictures from Mars to tell us where the rover is. So you could miss really interesting things along the way. And this happened to us with curiosity. This is Marea's pass. And we were driving along and wanted to get to this destination on the other side because Mars conjunction was coming when the sun gets between Earth and Mars. Later on, we got data down where this very benign liquid rock elk, which we had blindly targeted with the spectrometer on the rover, which is the uh, ChemCam spectrometer, its, it's field of view is so narrow, it's just uh, micro radiance. So then we discovered that it had really high silica and ended up having to go all the way back to sample it. So on uh, Curiosity and Perseverance, we now have the ability to do on board, we take a wide angle image, autonomously detect where the features of interest are, rank them based on criteria scientists provide. You know, today I wanna to see a light rock, I wanna see a large rock, I wanna see a particular shape rock. And then we target it autonomously without ground in the loop with the laser. So these capabilities allow, we wouldn't use AutoNav if we missed all the science along the way. So you need the complementary capabilities uh, for the autonomous capabilities. And this showing how, you know, blindly you might have targeted sand. This is an actual image from Mars where we targeted the few rocks you could see. And the last thing I was going to mention is really one of the hardest things we do is manipulation, contact, surfaces on Mars, which we know partially through sensing that's imperfect. And we have to position instruments that are so sensitive within centimeters. So the pixel instrument requires us to position it without 2.4 centimeters of the surface. The end-to-end -end robotic arm uncertainty is like four and a half centimeters. So there's a lot of things we have to do. What we are doing now is we are autonomously able to, after a drive, detect where the autonomous navigation can leave us with a pile of rocks right in front, where if we unstowed the arm, that would be a collision. So we can build terrain models using the cameras on the rover, 
but we also have a collision model of the rover and the terrain, and we can autonomously figure out where we should uh, unstow the robotic arm and take images. Uh, this is something we're in the process of deploying. So all of these capabilities together uh, help us accomplish the robotic operations over a period of years we've now been operating for several decades with different rovers on Mars. So uh, thank you. And if you have additional questions, uh, there are a lot of websites we have and I provide my email there for, to you as well. Thank you. Uh, I'm Alan Boyle. I'm a contributing editor at GeekWire and I covered uh, perseverance and ingenuity uh, as it was happening. I remember uh, all the fun stuff that was going on in, uh, in February of last year and uh, it's been a year now and uh, I'd love to ask the panelists and, and maybe Vandy in particular whether uh, you are where you thought you would be uh, at this time uh, a year ago. Uh, and when I say where, I mean location as well as science return. Actually, it's been very interesting. I think in some ways we have far exceeded our expectations. Uh, you know, ingenuity, uh, the helicopter was supposed to last for three flights. Uh, we're now on flight, uh, you know, 28. So that's been above and beyond expectation. Also, um, we've already cached eight rock cores, one atmospheric sample and a witness two, and we're at the Delta. So that's very exciting. When we landed all the way across, it wasn't clear how long it would take us to get there. Uh, and as uh, the stories unfolded, it's actually been, um, it's been quite amazing. So it's great. Great, thank you. Uh, uh, we're already getting questions coming in from our audience, and, and please do feel free to contribute your questions using, using the, the Q&A feature. And the moderators are going through those questions and passing them along to me. And, and so uh, we'll get to as many questions as we can in the course of a half hour. Uh, one, I think, uh, may be directed mostly at Andrew, perhaps, uh, for the vision-based autonomous landing system, what was the fail-safe plan if a, if a sandstorm happened? Could SAR, uh, synthetic uh, radar, or RF radio frequency-based methods be used instead? Right, so yes, uh, Mars is notoriously dusty. Uh, it can have global dust storms. We also have a very good understanding of the cycle of those dust storms, and they happen basically um, you know, in sync with how Mars orbits uh, the sun. So we knew that we were going to a very low dust time and that's actually what happened. If there had been a dust storm uh, and it was very thick, then the image, the camera image would not be able to see through that, but it would have had to have been very anomalous for that time of year. And, and so, uh, so, un so unlikely that we really don't design for it. Um, if you were to land somewhere that has a, a thick atmosphere uh, or you would, did need to land during a dust storm, then yes, you could use um, RF-based methods that are less susceptible to the dust because of the wavelength. And also there are other missions to other planets that use RF methods to Venus to do radar mapping, and then Cassini at Saturn mapped out Titan using RF as well. So those are um, definitely techniques that could be employed. They are, however, typically, um, in some cases, um, not as high of an accuracy. The, the size of the pixels are bigger on the ground for those sensors versus imagery. But, uh, you know, we use imagery because it does give you a very wide field of view at high resolution. Very good. I think this question is mostly to Emily. Does the visualization system have a standard API and can it be used to visualize any other mission with whatever space vehicle? Does it only visualize the landing or the whole mission from launching through space until landing and afterward? Is it something proprietary or can it be open source and open for public use and contribution? So <laughs> um, I can answer, I think I could answer all of those in one go here. Um, we are, this specific visualization was pretty tied to Mars 2020 in a lot of ways, like with, as within the implementation of it. Um, I am currently working on a task and with my manager and, and another person to create, uh, based on the Mars 2020 visualization, to create a more multi-mission, a more generic framework so that we can, like there always will be a need for custom code for each specific mission because they are 
like there are very different types of missions and very different points in which you would want to visualize events. But we, in the, we are creating this framework in the hopes that it will be easier to get these kind of visualizations off the ground. Like this, the Mars 2021 took about a year and change, maybe a year and a half to develop fully from start to finish. And so we're hoping to shorten that process and um, make it so that less developer time and less like kind of mission expert, so, so to speak, time is needed to create these visualizations. And so to, as to part one, it's a work in progress. I'm looking at your question in text here. Part two, um, this one only visualized the EDL sequence, so entry, descent, and landing. It could, and we could also, in theory, visualize uh, the cruise stage, which is like traveling through space, or we could visualize other events during cruise. Um, it all depends on what data is available to us and what we can do with it. But yeah, I think lots of things are possible. And then as for, is it open source? No, currently it is not open source. I actually saw people asking this on Twitter as well. Um, but it's currently not open source. It's currently like all internal within JPL. Um, I don't know if the Mars 2021 would be able to be public or open source. I'm hopeful that we will have part of this be open source in the future, but that is not currently in the books or not currently in the works, I'll say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I think this is a question that anyone can feel free to weigh in on. Uh, first, the questioner uh, gives a shout out to the early engineering grads who started the Jet Propulsion Laboratory when they moved from White Sands in the late 50s and early 60s. Phil Ekman was the head. And then uh, the questioner says there were 11 others from classes of 58, 59, and 60. Anyway, that sets the stage for uh, asking you what you learned at, at CMU that really has helped you the most as you're working on a Mars mission and all the other things that you're doing. I can, Don't well, all speak at I once. Can, I can take it first. Go ahead. Um, I can at least speak from my undergrad experience. I took... I was a robotics additional major at CMU, so I took around 10 robotics classes while I was there. And those are definitely the most essential <laughs> classes to learning what to do at JPL. Um, I think I took the capstone class had intro to systems engineering, where I learned a lot about requirements and all the kind of documents that went into pretty much every mission at JPL. And then um, I learned a lot about frame transformations as well in the robotics classes, and that was essential to developing the visualization. So. I can definitely say robotics is great. <laughs> Go ahead, Vandy. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, there are things, CMU was fantastic in the regard, both because we would do theoretical classes, also, you know, specialized one in particular areas, right from, you know, mechatronics to computer vision to planning and doing a lot of autonomous navigation. But I also was able to work on uh, a lot of robotic um, actual deployed robots. You know, I worked on uh, the Field Robotics Center where we took robots to the Atacama Desert or, you know, deployed robots in the Arctic and Antarctic. And those are really useful because you come up with, and this is really a lot about, you will iterate on that process. You come up with a solution. And then when you're deploying it on a resource constrained system, you have to modify it, augment it, and really start to know what the shortcomings are. You know, it's not perfect data. And knowing how you can be robust to that is, I think, been very useful. There are a lot of people from CMU who work on especially the algorithms and software and autonomy that we run on board the rover. Yeah, and so I, um, I would say that the number one thing I learned at CMU was how to program. Um, you know, that's definitely required there and it's required here. Um, I was in the vision area, so and I'm still doing vision now, so that was very useful, of course. I was using more LIDAR and three-dimensional vision back then. Now I do mostly image. Um, also, kind of riffing on what Vandy said, I worked on a team uh, with, with real robots, and that's very important to have that, you know, combination of the real world experience uh, with, combined with your research and your algorithmic developments. That's very much the way that things are done here at JPL, just like they're done that way at CMU. 
There's a follow-up for Emily. What would you advise for students interested in, in going into the field? Uh, the questioner watched the landing with the UI stuff, the user, user interface with kids live, and it was a lot of fun. Yeah, I, I'm super glad that you watched it with kids. I think people have told me they watched it with kids, and it makes me quite happy that it worked as a public outreach thing. Um, but I guess for for like young students interested in going into the field, I guess I would say um, try. I guess try to do um, some extracurriculars related to robotics. There are a lot of them out there these days. I know first robotics is really popular now. Um, it was popular when I did it in high school too. I was part of my high school's first robotics team in a tangential sense. But I think that stuff is kind of really useful for getting kids excited about robotics. So I think that's always fun to do. Um, I also, <laughs> not to just say be a teacher's pet, but I befriended teachers when I was in high school. I was befriend, like, was pretty befriended my physics teacher and got to talk to him a lot about science stuff. And so I think that also helped me uh, figure out what I wanted to do and make sure that was computer science and then um, go off and go off to CMU and get the computer science degree. So um, yeah, but I would just say like, try to do, try to find what you're really interested in and then just like do that thing, so. Yeah, because we're, you know, focusing on CMU and engineering, we're getting some geeky questions, which I love. And I, I know that our panelists are going to love them too. Uh, for example, the uh, entire landing process was such a wild combination of methods that had to happen successfully in sequence. Are other future rovers going to use a similar system? And I believe that like Curiosity, the Perseverance rover was brought uh, with brought to the surface using a uh, sky crane sort of a, approach and lowered down. And we all saw the images of how crazy that landing looked. Uh, is that the standard or are you talking about other methods, uh, perhaps propulsive landing? So when you land a rover, a large rover like Perseverance and Curiosity, you have the advantage of having these wheels that you can land on. So um, the sky crane really took advantage of that. And by doing so, it eliminated having to drive the rover off of a pallet or some kind of lander. So you just basically touch it down. It's very efficient. The next mission is going to be the mission that retrieves the samples uh, from that, that Perseverance is collecting. And so you have to land a very large rocket that is going to, um, where there'll be robotically the samples we placed in the rocket and the rocket will launch from Mars and put those samples into orbit to be picked up by another spacecraft. That's that lander will be a will be a fixed lander. It will not be a rover. Um, there are different. We have to collect the samples and get them to that lander. And uh, you know, there's a rover that's required to do that, um, but it's not landed on that actual mission. So that one's uh, does not have the sky crane, but it's still got all the components of the heat shield and uh, the parachute and the propulsive s slowing down. And you anticipated uh, one of the other questions that has come to the fore is what, what you all are working on next. Uh, Mars sample return, of course, was one of the um, objectives for the Perseverance rover. As Vandy mentioned, you're saving up the samples to be collected at a later time. And I understand that the details of that are, are still being discussed. For example, uh, I think at one time they were talking about uh, launching something in 2026. Now it might be 2028 and it might be two spacecraft, uh, uh, a lander with the rocket and then a rover that goes and collects the samples and brings them back to the rocket. So um, we could probably spend the rest of this time talking about sample return, but, but maybe you could just kind of give a quick uh, summary of uh, what you're working on for the next mission. I'm willing to take it again, but uh, I'll give you guys a chance to go first. You know, so I think I'll, I would just add that because the whole goal of this was to bring the sample back, so we're very much actually that part of that mission has already started. Generally, most of us who work on the development work for many years before you see it. So Mars sample return is very much in progress. It consists of, you know, getting the lander to Mars and there um, 
are, is also collaboration with the European Space Agency that will be doing a rover. And we have to have Perseverance cash and drop off the samples. So we're already coordinating with the mission even as Perseverance is scouting and looking at locations that might be good spots where we land and also drop off the samples. We drop them one at a time about five meters apart so that the rover that's coming to collect them would have enough room to maneuver. So that's very much in progress. And Andrew, you could probably talk about the landing. Uh, so I, I, I will, um, actually there's some other bodies besides Mars that you can go to in the solar system. Um, we really do a ton of Mars work here, but we also do other missions. So um, this uh, com the community of scientists recently released uh, what's called the Planetary Science Decadal Survey. And they um, kind of lay out the goals, the science goals, which is why we're here, is to do the science. Um, one thing, you know, a couple places that, one new place that showed up quite prominently in that, uh, in that report was Enceladus, which is a moon of Saturn. And it is the brightest, ob brightest object in the solar system. And it's uh, covered in ice and it has an ocean underneath the ice. And it also has plumes coming out of the South Pole that could contain material from that ocean underneath. And so that's a very exciting robotic and autonomous mission to go there and get those, get something from those plumes because potentially if there's an ocean, there could potentially be life in the ocean. And if you're sending particles out, you know, you possibly could capture some of that life in, in those particles. So that's, that's really compelling. That would require new architectures there's also um, landing on a moon of Jupiter called Europa, another icy moon that contains a global ocean. Uh, we have Clipper coming up, which is an orbiter of Europa. Excuse me, it does flybys, but it's a big mission that uh, you know that that JPL is working on with other organizations. So, um, comets and asteroids always um, important. And then there's NASA's push to go back to the moon. So the technologies that I talked about with the terrain relative navigation, there's also a related technology called uh, hazard detection and avoidance where you build a map of the ground to identify hazards you can't see from orbit. That's something that, that people are working on for landing on the moon for both robotic landers as well as uh, crewed landers. And both of these have very large involvements from the commercial sector, but JPL is supporting those. Emily, what are you up to looking ahead? <laughs> well, in some ways, I kind of, I am, we are not at the point where MSR would have any visualization involvement in it. That's definitely a few years out. Um, but this multi, but I'm working on this multi-mission biz effort in the hopes that by the time we get there, it'll be ready to use for MSR and for um, actually, I think for probably for Clipper as well and NISAR. Some, and then, I mean, for me personally, I've kind of went backwards in a way. I, I just as we have landed on Mars for Mars 2020, I started rover operate, rover planner training for Curiosity, which is the rover on Mars that's been up there for almost 10 years. And um, so that's been really great. Working on the surface operations side of things has been quite an adventure. And of course, there's always there's always software products that need work. So I've been putting my software engineering skills to use on various other non-mission related things. Speaking of uh, surface operations, um, we got a couple of questions that maybe Fandy would like to tackle in terms of the nuts and bolts of surface operations. For example, you mentioned that the rover traveled five kilometers in three weeks. Why is it challenging to travel at a higher speed on Mars, even though the terrain images look quite empty? I think I know the answer to that one. And what are the primary challenges for autonomously navigating a rover or, an, uh, or a robotic ground vehicle on Mars? And then there's a related question about uh, Ingenuity's uh, operations. Does Ingenuity cause dust to fly around during takeoff and landing, similar to helicopters on Earth? How does it vis handle visual uh, odometry and visual tracking in those situations? Oh, and then make sure you unmute yourself. Yeah, I was like, I'll go in the reverse order and answer the ingenuity question and uh, remember the previous one. So with ingenuity, one thing we noticed, we were very much worried about the dust 
because it's actually solar powered. And so the dust settles on the solar panels that could result in it not having sufficient charge for the next flight. But we've, uh, as soon as it takes off, we actually find that the dust blows off. And you can look at images where we've landed and one of the legs is embedded in dust and it's taking off. You can actually see the nav navigation cameras catch one of those where you can see the dust coming off. But in terms of visual odometry, it is the dust itself, it's not generating that much because it's, it's a pretty light vehicle. So once it's taken off, we haven't found the dust itself to be a challenge with the tracking where it's taking the images and it's doing position estimation. The thing that dust has been interesting and a challenge for is that the atmospheric density is increasing. So the dust uh, density, and this is challenging uh, for uh, the flights. As the temperature on Mars, as we've gone into the summer, it's actually thinner, the air, and that makes flights harder because you have to spin the blades faster and we've been doing some of that. So there are definitely challenges related to that, but not particularly at the moment uh, due to the vision. Now, in terms of perseverance, why it's difficult to drive faster, there's multiple factors. So one is you think we have an entire day and we just drive for the whole day, but actually we don't. And part of the reason is that we can only, the rover is nuclear powered, but it generates power from this RTG. It's like a, like a little light bulb. And so we do a lot of naps. The rover sleeps most of the day. And we, we get on a really good day, we can get about a couple of hours, maybe around that time for driving. So that's, that's about the time you have for driving. There's also science and other things. So power is a constraint. And because they are using cameras, we are limited to, the day, uh, to daytime hours. The, and it, we have to time it with orbiters coming down if we want to get data down to make a decision uh, eventually. Now, the other challenge is just the speed at which our wheels move. So they need, move about 0.1 miles an hour, so 4.4 uh, centimeters a second. That's super slow. And the reason is that the mechanical system, they haven't you know, found a need to, that we've got a lot of advantage by moving very fast. But the challenge with navigation, when you look at the terrain, and it may look at to be fairly empty, but we constantly come across hazards that would actually collide with the rover's body and be very damaging. So that's almost more challenging. You know, this was the same case with Meridiani with Opportunity, mostly open space and then there are big boulders. And we've encountered quite a many of these. Even a single massive boulder running into that is not really an option. We chose this path to be uh, collision free. The challenge, the, one of the biggest challenge really with our vision-based system is sand, both for visual odometry and for autonomous detection. Because if we can't correlate the image and get 3D data on it, um, that'll be challenging. So we don't trust that it'll detect it as missing data, the onboard stereo. And so on the ground in orbital images, we mark out geometric shapes to say, stay out of this area. But the rover as it's driving has uncertainty, even with the visual odometry about two, you know, two to 5% per uh, you know, um, meter of distance travel, just it's a percentage of the distance travel, so by the time you get to 500 kilometers without Earth and the loop up to seven, you can be meters off. And that allows it to make it very harder to get through narrow passageways. So these are some of the challenges. We don't have GPS and we have a lot of uncertainty. So really the biggest challenge really is the uncertainty. And there's kind it's of a follow-up answer. question, how, how, you, uh, how you estimate ground traversability for Perseverance. Are there digital elevation maps or what? Uh, I, I bet you wish you had GPS for Mars. Right, so we don't have that. We do have orbiters around Mars. So we have the high-rise camera on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter and they take really good images, but these images are not localized with the rover's position very accurately. We do localize them to some degree of accuracy. Um, so we have orbital images, but they give us a resolution, you know, on the order of, um, you know, tens of meters, so 25 meters or so. Uh, or we can get in some area 25 centimeters, so there's different resolutions. When we drive in the orbital images, it's not accurate enough for us to get, detect all of the hazards, the rocks. Uh, so we cannot blindly drive in the orbital images. So those are, that's the data we have. And then we take images from our cameras 
and we build uh, autonomous height maps on board the rover. So that's how we have information is through the rover's cameras and through orbital cameras. All right. Well, we're coming toward the end of our time. And so I thought I'd throw out uh, maybe an invitation for big picture answers to some of the big questions surrounding Mars. Uh, I, I'm sure you get the question all the time is when do you think we will detect, uh, you know, uh, unmistakable uh, traces of life, either ancient life or existing extant life? on Mars, uh, if ever. And uh, do, is there anything you want to say about the wider search for life beyond Earth? Uh, Andrew, you already referred to looking at Europa and Enceladus for traces of life. So uh, think big picture here. Vandy, you need to take the, uh, or you can defer the question about life on Mars. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm ha happy to take it. So one of the things really is, right, we do think we're going to find signs of potential past life. That's kind of why we're there. And the probability, if you look at it somewhere in the universe, uh, in the solar system per se, so we're, you know, we, we're sending increasingly complex instruments that are able to collect information to piece together the puzzle. And it's quite impressive how much information we can glean from correlated data, you know, spectrometers, imagers, and other pieces of information. So there's lots of scientists who are expert in this field and they use earth analog correlations. So whether we'll find life, that's the hope. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, in terms of where, I think what was the second part of the question, I guess, was that something I forget the bigger picture you know even looking beyond mars the the, the deep and I, question. right i think andrew commented on that we are already we are always working on the future missions and so there are missions you know to venus to enceladus europa and various things like how do you you know sample the tubes but snake robots going into the vents and various other platform. So in the early stages, we iterate with the design to see what the best way to sample might be. Yeah, I just say that, you know, it's really great to work at a place that has a mission. You know, one of our main goals is to answer that question. Is there life on another planet? And that's just so rewarding. Um, and I think that JPL is addressing that in all kinds of different ways. Uh, so is NASA, but you know, we there's Mars, there's Enceladus, Europa, there's looking at exoplanets. Um, so that's really why we're here, you know, is to, to go after that question and other science questions. Yeah, I think I'm mostly excited just to help answer the question. Do I think, what do I, what do I like theorize about it? I don't know, I'm not a scientist, but I am a computer programmer and I do like helping with robotic stuff and so i think helping to find the answer is really great i agree with andrew here is this something that you thought you would be delving into when you were at cmu or were you just thinking oh i love robots and that's it uh did the questions the deeper questions about life in the universe uh enter your mind when you were at attending college go ahead emily yeah, I think for, for me, working at JPO was my dream job, like at the end of high school and through college. So um, I think ex space exploration in general was always kind of a, a passion of mine. And so like just I think we can learn a lot from planets that aren't ours. And so um, <laughs> that in combination with loving robotics was what drew me to JPL in particular. I think robotic missions are really useful for going places where humans can't go yet and getting lots of scientific data from those locations. So right. when I was at, go ahead. I'll just go ahead, quickly Andy. add that um, I actually had to choose, I was what I graduated during the first dot com boom and I had to choose between a, you know, a, a company and JPL, I was going to go with the company. And then I spoke to my dad and he thought I was crazy to not go to JPL because of the past history of all the great things that has worked on. And, and I think he was right. I, you know, it's really been very rewarding. And Vandy, I guess it's up to you. <laughs> I think one thing, you know, 
what I'll add is, as you notice from everybody here, we all do different things. But in order to accomplish this mission, you really have to have a ton of people working in different areas. And that's also a lot of fun. You get to work with experts in a variety of fields who all work together in that landing day you feel this sense of teamwork. So if you like working with a set of people towards a common purpose, it, the purpose is important, you know, it's answering these questions, but it's also actually a lot of fun to work with people who are all very good at what they do. Well, this has been really fascinating. Uh, I want to thank uh, Andrew and Emily and Vandy for uh, giving us a window into the frontiers of the universe, you know, the big questions and the smaller questions, you know, what, what's that tiny little microscopic thing on Mars or what is, uh, what's the uh, prospects for finding life on another planet? And I, I guess we'll have to stay tuned for that over the coming months and years for, for more dispatches from Mars and from our friends at CMU. And I, I want to thank uh, CMU as well. Uh, it, was, it was really great that Marshall was able to join us and I want to thank him so much for his remarks. And, and uh, so this is Alan Boyle from uh, GeekWire. Uh, I have a little stock phrase that I say, so I'm going to go ahead and say it. Just watch the skies. <laughs>